Guys, give me a second. I'm going to see if I can put it on the screen there. Sometimes those little things go crazy on me, and I don't know why. So if they keep doing that, I will. What's just up, Max? Move them. Hey, guys. This is Thomas from Video Mantis. We're live for another podcast. This is a VM discussion. I'm here today with Thomas Cassetta. How you doing, buddy? Hey. How's it going? Good, man. And I, uh, I heard that you just got off of – sorry, I'm killing the feed. So, guys, just let me know if there's any uh, problems with the audio or whatever with the feed. Just let us know on the uh, feed. We're obviously watching here. Are those so, – uh, Yeah, I'm actually going to fix those while you talk for a ti second. Titles to seizure by? Yeah, basically, you know, it's it's a program. Facebook is doing so many different things, honestly. Yeah. With Cambridge Analytica, they've got the government, like, right up the cojones right now, <laughs> if you ask me. And what happens is that my broadcasting software is, like, getting updated, like, every single day with new protocols. Sure. Like, literally today, I was like, oh, okay, you know, we're going to go Facebook Live. And I'm like, oh, I literally can't unless if I update and agree to these terms just to be able to go live now. Right. So what I'm going to do is while uh, you're talking for a minute and telling me about yourself, I'm going to fix this so this doesn't give uh, people a seizure. Hey, Daniel and Eric. Uh, okay, so, yeah, a little bit about myself. I am... There we go. So I fixed that, and then I'm going to move <laughs> those. I apologize, guys. We're working on a couple problems here. But, oh. yeah, please oh, keep talking and see. say hello. Uh, I am a production sound mixer and re-recording mixer. I've been mixing sound professionally for about 20... I'm in my 22nd year. Uh, I started really, really young. Um, when I was 12, I, I saw a mixing board. I have a creaky chair. Frodo? We're going to have to switch. Uh oh. <laughs> can you, um, Frodo, can you uh, step on here for a second? Watch your LaCroix for a second. Frodo, go on, get up here. Yep. This, this yep. is brought there to you go. by Cats and LaCroix. Yep, exactly. Meow. Thank you. Frodo, you can come back. Okay, well, he'll come back. It's so difficult, and there's so much competition, and there's so many people here. And in L.A., we have the benefit of having this really incredible community of sound mixers yeah. who, um, you know, both through the union, through CAS, and through independent uh, organizations and groups like LA Sound Mixers, you know, we we have sort of reshaped the community to uh, sort of not exactly look like you know a comp like your normal competitive workspace where you know y you got to be careful. You know, a lot of people are really afraid of who they bring into their circles, totally. and they're really uh, so. I mean, it's not that we're not careful, and it's not that we're, you know, we don't have the same sort of judicious mindset of, you know, keeping, um, you know, keeping our circles neat. But uh, the only thing that really helps me advance ever is when I just focus on the craft mm -hmm. um, and, and then just get out and meet people and, you know, study what it means to for other people in the other departments as well because you know sound is such a mysterious art for a lot of people right. um on a film set and in post production that a lot of what we be, we have to become ambassadors and so we have to become ambassadors for our department but we also have part of being an ambassador is not just saying this is what i need and this is what, you know and sort of becoming this sort of brick wall of yeah uh of opinion is become is reaching out and and finding creating bridges and finding out how to communicate to the different departments so that ultimately you can express that you understand where they're at and not in a, you know, patronizing way, but in a, in totally. a fun, you totally. know, the best crew members I've ever worked with, the best utilities and the best boom ops, they're always like open, fun, appreciative. They call, they call people friends. They, I mean, they feel like doing this on set. That's Absolutely. annoying. Like, uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm teasing. Uh, no, but th there's this genuine desire to connect and understand what the other people on the set do. And sure. I, and so I think that goes beyond production and that goes to, you know, that goes through post-production, that goes to production, uh, the production department and understanding what their pressures are, budgetary, you know, um, their schedules, what they have to deal with. And then, you know, you don't have to, like, I think there's this idea in young in the young minds coming into the community that you have to bend over backwards and do, you know, and sacrifice and work for really bad rates and, and, you know, throw in gear for free just to sort of like set yourself up on a pedestal above other people. And the reality is what you're doing is you're digging yourself down. Mm. You're creating this, this world where, you know, 
I don't necessarily subscribe to this idea that as a whole, as an industry, we're sort of on a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, I'm a merit talk. <laughs> I believe in merit. I believe in, you know, this idea that if you if you deliver a good product and you d and you serve your client and you serve the set well and you're also f fun to work with, that you'll you'll keep getting hired and they'll say, you know what, I don't have to worry when T Pop is on set. Yeah. Or I don't have to worry when, um, you know, this person's on set because I just, I don't have to worry. Yeah. And that's all it means to them. Yeah, exactly. If you've got five, yeah. ten clients like that, you know, you're going to be doing okay in life, you know. Yeah. They just kind of let you do your thing. Right. That's great. And everything in my world has always been word of mouth. Uh, it's always been... Um, Sorry, Jim. My bad. You know, I, I've been given a lot of opportunities from from other mixers who, you know, if to sit here and try to name them all would be absurd. Yeah, but, uh, sure. Other mixers, you know, we are each other's lifeblood in a sense. And serving that mixer and, and you know, treating their client well and then stepping back when that client comes back, you know, and giving it back to the mixer who, you know, who referred you. I mean, there's so many. Did you guys hear that, by the way? You know, giving it back to the mixer that referred you. One of the things that I always say when I'm working for uh, someone else's client is when I'm done for the day, I go up and I shake everybody's hand. And I say, hey, thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Right. If you ever have any other work, please call so-and-so. Now, if he's not available, I would love to help you. Right. And you there's know? different ways of approaching it. I've definitely tripped and fallen in, in some cases where, mm -hmm. you know, I made a mistake or that the client was communicating to me and I thought they were communicating to both. And Or somebody it, else it calls get... you and you don't even know they're from that, exactly. from that company. I'm... And then you're like, oh, dude, I didn't know. Right. Oops, exactly. Sorry. And so sometimes you sort of have to What do you back. do in that situation? Oh gosh. Uh where you accidentally take somebody's job. Guys, if you this is a VM discussion, so if you yeah. have any uh anything to add, please do so. Uh I I did at one point. I won't I won't name names. I accidentally did at one point and part of it was um a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Um and so part of it was stepping back and trying to discuss the misunderstanding and and then you know, it I essentially put up a brick wall between myself and the client. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not available. And it never became about, like, it never became awkward about, oh, hey, I accidentally, you know, like, you don't put the client in the middle of yeah, it. Yeah, I took Bob's job. You're going to have sorry. to actually call him. I'm so sorry. Well, sometimes I, I show that deference up front. And, you know, when they call and they say, oh, you were really great. Like, I was working on a feature film and I was brought in and I was, like, the fourth mixer i think on this show oh, wow. and the third mixer had to take a day off so he just needed a day player i came in uh they hadn't like the producer who mentioned this to me had never worked with this guy before i didn't know oh, that wow. did we go dead no it's all good basically everybody knows it the camera goes shut oh. uh, auto live every 30 minutes so oh. it just comes back on and it should be back on. and now. we're in different clothes <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, Hi, everybody. Yeah, we're <laughs> back. Hi. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, uh, everybody knows that that happens every once in a while. Uh, Eric Ballou is saying kickbacks? Question mark. Uh, I don't really know that. I don't. I. I don't. I don't do kickbacks. I don't either. I. Uh, I don't inherently disagree with them, but what is a kickback? Let's say it for the people that don't know. So a kickback is um, if. Add these freaking toes. I'm gonna try again. If I get somebody a job, if I refer them on a job, I get a portion of their pay as a referral fee in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, the architecture of that, it just becomes like sound mixers. I don't. I don't think the gig economy can support like monopolizing sound mixers. Yeah. Um. I mean, there there are some ways where you can organize your circle and they can work under your company and maybe you protect them with, maybe there's a way where you can do it legitimately where you're, you're bringing people up and you're supporting them and you're supplying, you know, mixers with gear who need gear. I mean, there are ways to do it. Right. But then it's built into, I think a fee based system where, you know, as, as the supporting company, they pay you and then you pay all the taxes and you pay all of the workman's comp and you have employees working Absolute. under you. Oh, I and definitely they have to agree it should be that way, yeah. But, but in, I mean, there are other ways to do it. I've worked, I've worked 
other mixers have referred me on jobs where mm -hmm. they'll um you know they'll get the gear mm -hmm. and uh they give me a slice of it like essentially i'm using my gear but i'll do i'll do payroll with the production company but it's all organized through the company and so like i mean ultimately as mixers i mean we sort of have to understand we we sort of ask, have to ask ourselves what how do we want to work and yeah. personally i don't want to be organizing a bunch of you know insurance documents i don't want to be a, a, a businessman to that extent where i have to uh then manage expectations and then part of it becomes about maintaining those clients and yeah, it does add a and, lot and more so work on after the day's done and, and when you're working with young people sometimes you're dealing with you know um different different attitudes and different personalities when as mixers part of our brand is who we are and yeah. how we present ourselves how we solve problems for the, sure the the information that we understand uh and the you know the sort of uh i think as ambassadors we're constantly breaking down dogma yeah. and we're coming and you have to because you have to yeah. come at you have to come at problems on set from different perspectives all the time sometimes you might have a problem and the correct answer is to step back and just let it and not yeah. bring it up. Yeah, exactly. Let it go. <laughs> just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you see the director and he's sweating bullets and, you know, it's the end of the day. And, you know, they have the eyes of, you know, the eyes of plenty looking at you. And you mm -hmm. have executive producers sort of looking down on this moment. Are we going to capture this moment? And it's not about sound at that moment. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's about sneaking in a fix while nobody's yeah, looking exactly. as long as you're ready to go. Oh, yeah, totally. You know what? If you know you're going to get one or two or three takes, you know what? If it didn't work on take one and you know that you can fix something quickly, right. get it done and just get in there, get out there. Don't be like, hey, everybody, <laughs> right. sorry. It's, can we just stop for a minute? You it's know, kind like, of it's kind of a newbie move yeah. to like always throw up a flag dun, when something's dun, dun, wrong. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, exactly. Like, look at the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I screwed up. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. Uh, and, and part of just with uh, we 10% is... Oh man, we're still talking about still talking about kickbacks, huh? Yeah, I guess so. What, um, no, no cash paying. Like, oh, and by the way, I guess I would say kickbacks would definitely be different than like you know if if somebody's doing a job and you're saying, but I want you to use my gear, you know, because maybe it's a job and I don't want to like replace the package and right. conf confuse the workflow, right, or whatever. So sometimes you just gotta deal with it and you know accept the job if you understand what you're getting into or right. say hey listen you know what i'm sorry no offense but I i'm not i'm not like that it's me and my gear or i don't do it and you know what there's there's nothing wrong with saying that you know if the person talking to you as a sound mixer friend goes god you're a dick for that it's like you know what <laughs> screw them in a way i hate to say it it's like you know you yeah. need to be comfortable with what you're doing you know yeah, I mean, I, I mean, so much of so much of this is just sort of managing circles and managing personalities, mm -hmm. um, understanding you know, temperaments. Too. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm a firm believer. You know, a, a lot of, I think a lot of people go into this and they're like, I have my guys. I'm a firm believer oh, that yeah. every job has a unique, uh, a unique chemistry, and it's not always about. I'm going to work with this person or I'm going to work with this person or uh, sometimes it's political. Sometimes it's, yeah. you know, as, as Noel t is talking about is referring back. If, if you get a job from somebody, you refer back to them, but let's talk mm -hmm. about multi-person teams. I sometimes, sometimes you need a utility and a, and a boom operator or even a, you know, uh, more people right. on the team. Uh, and you need to, you know, part of it is personality. Part of it is you need, you need to fill based on personality. Part of it is, Sometimes it's I'm going to give this person a shot. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, that's kind of how I got my shot. S sometimes like I'm super protected by the nature of the shoot and I feel completely confident to say I've never worked with this person. Maybe they're young, maybe they're experienced, but I'm going to get I'm going to experiment with the chemistry of of adding this person to the team. For sure. Giving them a shot. Yeah. Put me in coach. And then and then there's the the reality and uh, a very experienced mixer um, once told uh, told me this in the middle of the conflict of, you know, the client mm -hmm. uh, issue. He said, ultimately, the client chooses. Yeah. And that's the reality.
ultimately the client, I mean, I can only speak from my perspective, uh, but his perspective informed mine. Yeah. And, you know, it really helped me shape and understand sometimes you just got to let go. I've lost clients before, you know, I've lost, you know, tens and tens of clients before because of sometimes because of stupid mistakes and sometimes just because of availability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was booked on a longer term show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was working weeks on end and then, hey, you know what? There's this other person coming in and um, it just became a reality that they were, we now shared a client. Yeah, yeah. So they may want to work with me. They want may want to work with a guy out in New York. Exactly. Yeah. Who knows? What can you do? Crazy. Guys, uh, we're here with Thomas Cassetta live on Video Mantis talking. Uh, let's see here. It says, Jim Hull says, using another person's gear may not be as fast as you can be because they have it set up differently than you um, than you do. Absolutely. I completely agree yeah. with that. That always makes me nervous, you know. You know, just using somebody else's package and, you know, especially with even like a Nomad or a Diva or something like that. Man, I mean, some people have their Nomad set up pretty, pretty crazy, you know. Can I, can I tie this together? For sure. So, um, you asked about people coming in. Sure. And I was speaking to a young lady today. We were actually doing like kind of a mentoring session. It was a really, really wonderful conversation. She had awesome. sort of the same conversation or uh, same questions about how to get in. And then with gear packages and all that. I really, really urge people when they come in not to just sort of brand themselves as a mixer and say, in any market, absolutely mm -hmm. in any market. I mean, certainly in other markets, you can't survive unless you pick up a, a, you know, a bag or you sit behind a desk. But if you're in a larger market, resist the temptation and the ego to sort of brand yourself as a mixer because the, the job as a mixer requires a lot of uh, a lot of understanding mm. and a lot of experience. It does. And when you are able to, uh, and I know the chances are becoming fewer and fewer as <laughs> it's sort of this sort of interwoven problem of where you have people coming in where they're calling themselves mixers, they're booming all all themselves, they're doing all the utility work all themselves. It doesn't open the door to a workflow that ultimately ends up serving the client and ends up serving our products in the end. But Maybe we should hey, retitle I got that. the job. Should we like it, maybe call those people like sound cyborgs? <laughs> what do you think? Is that a good idea? VM discussion. Let us know. Um, uh, so for me, if when you come up as a utility, mm -hmm. your your education and your understanding uh, broadens absolutely because you start working with other mixers with different understanding with different different experience levels, yeah, yeah, yeah. and not even it's not even about levels. It's just different experiences. Period. Will lend itself to different ways of approaching problems exactly. and so when you come up as a utility which you know is it's ironic because i when i came to la i i called myself a mixer and it's definitely the harder route uh and it's you know it's sort of i'm sure there were skeptical eyes looking like who is this who's this dumbass yeah right. coming in talking like what he, he knows what he's talking about yeah um but the reality is, is when is you really hard um when you know, as a utility, when you know all that gear, this question about knowing different work, you know, different setups and the intricacies and the little ins and outs, that's going to happen on any different show. Totally. Any, you know, when the show changes, the gear oftentimes has to change. You can't, yeah. it's not just like a one size fits all cart that you wheel in and Definitely you have everything. Not. Unless if you want that and you're going to pay full rate for the entire <laughs> right. cart. Right. And you're, and it's going to cost you right. 3500 a you're day. Get, hopefully you're getting a rate that will support wheeling four or five carts onto the set and you have exactly. a crew to back you up and get it, get it done in different scenarios. Exactly. Uh, rain, wind, snow, and you know, all yeah. that. But, when you know it, when you come up as a utility, walking in and looking at somebody's gear and how it's set is set up is not going to be as shocking if you call yourself a mixer from day one and, oh, crap, I didn't learn yeah. the Cantar system or I don't have any idea how to operate a patch bay or I, I don't have any idea yeah, exactly. how Dante networks or I, you know, and I'm speaking from my own ignorance uh you know there's times when i'll walk into a set setup and i'm like oh my gosh i gotta read this manual like five days before the totally, show totally and do. i'm prepping a kit yeah. and i'm like ah. yeah so dude why do yeah. you think i created video mantis and all those instructional videos when i forget to how i use the product for the free lacroix that i use every single day like you know context i'm like 
can't freaking figure this out. Or like, you know, the Electro R1A with the, the preset frequencies. I just had, I made the video so I could watch it myself right. when I forget how to do it. Right. You oh, know? oh, and there are times when like, I'll just have a complete and total brain fart. Yeah. I'll go work with other, with other mixers and I'll see their gear and I'm, my brain just goes. And it happens. all of that information that I had, you know, learned years ago, suddenly I'm used to my workflow or I'm yeah. used to the, anyway. The record button's here, and it's here on your card, and that's that's hard, you know. Smaller interview gigs, not really. <laughs> but the I, think work there, alone. I think there's a really intense conversation happening on this. I, uh, yeah, what's going on, guys? Man. Can't tell. Gear packages are personal. He's a person. Okay. Self-help. Daniel you Powell, how are you doing? Af- you can't be afraid to fire a bad client. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Right on. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes it's about just saying no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sorry. That's that's I'm actually a boundary I have right now. Hmm. Um, I won't do a narrative job without a boom operator. Boom. There you go. I won't do it. If it's a script? If it's a script, I need a, I boom, need a boom op. op. Period. And if there's two cameras, I need a boom and a utility. There you go. And sometimes, you know, I don't know. Anyway. How's it working out? Let's, I'm not, I'm just being honest. It really? It being on, yeah, yeah. Honestly, right now it's hard. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know narrative right now is really slow anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I have been super, super busy with stand-up comedy shows, and I've been super, super busy with fitness um, videos, which, uh, you know. You know what? Uh, sorry, let me ask the question differently because I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. No, no, that. no, not at all. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get more out of is just to help <laughs> the students. Like, how's that yeah, working, how's out, that for working you? out for you, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm such an asshole. Um, I'm basically saying, like, how does it work out on the phone when you've got somebody that calls? Okay, scenario, ring, pick up your phone. Yeah, what's up? Hey, this is uh, Billy, and I've got a movie here, uh, and I heard that you're the best sound mixer in Hollywood. How you doing? What what kind of smoke are you trying to blow up my ass? By? Oh Jesus! Wow, this is such a hard phone call. Okay, <laughs> so no, but like for no, real. No, the, like, rea- the reality is, I say, oh great, it's it's great to hear from you. Um, tell me a little bit about your film. Well, we're we're doing a narrative short. It, it, it is going to be. It's going to go to Netflix. Um, and there's four people involved. Um, it's a, it's a, actually a big scene that happens around a dinner table. It's a very very long scene. It's actually one whole big scene that takes 15 pages long. Okay. You know, just continual talking around the dining room table. And the camera's probably going to be, like, going 360 around it. You know, like that shot in Reservoir Dogs, you know, where they're just going around the table and they're eating and stuff? Like that. I want to do that. Yeah. Can you help me with that? That sounds really ambitious. Uh, do you um, – how many cam- – are you doing a single camera, like single shot style? or what are you, Yeah, what are you single doing? shot, one take. That's what we got. In fact, it's just got to be – that's it. Okay. What do you think? How many characters did you say again? Four. Four. Only four characters. Only four. Mm, okay. I like that. Only four. Don't be afraid. Okay. Single camera. Mm-hmm. Um, On a dolly track, circular around the table. Okay. You know, just kind of, it's it's continually pushing around the table, you know, as as the dialogue goes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you have any situation where you think you might add a second camera, you might go in for coverage, or are you really committed to this this shooting style. I mean, it sounds like a really interesting idea. You know what? Now that you mention it, we might throw a bush outside the window and throw maybe like another, like a red epic out there on like a 200 mil lens. And what like is this turning into? Right Thomas? into what is I don't know. Well, I'm just kind of hearing like, uh, what would you the say? The next like steps I would say is I'd say, you know, that's, you know, it's really hard for me to qualify entirely over the phone. I'd be very happy to read a script and I'd love to, I'd love to get an idea of the direction you're going. But oftentimes the reality is sometimes these narrative jobs are hiring at the very last minute, mm-hmm. and so you get a call and you're like, like, oh, we they've got I only four have or five hundred all in, and it's only a one man band type of deal. I don't have room for a boom op. Is that okay? Well, you know, honestly, for a three sixty shot spinning around, uh, it it's hard for me to entirely know how how the coverage is going to be. The light's going to come into into play a lot. I typically don't work on narratives without a boom op. Uh, on this show, it sounds like that guy might be utilized to uh, to rig wires. Mm. So I would really appreciate having the budget adjusted so that so that it can include that person. Because when I'm on set, I, uh, being able to focus on the mix and communicate with um, 
the powers that be to ultimately deliver a product that delivers on your creative intentions is the most important thing. And when I'm holding a boom and or trying to just mix wires like a reality show, oftentimes I can't serve the narrative and I can't serve your edit or your po or in post. And so if you're not able to budge that, I you know, I completely understand sometimes, you know, I, the dollar signs speak louder, but I really feel strongly that I can do you better service and I can create a soundtrack that's going to serve you uh, through delivery and, and sale, uh, especially if you're going to a, a high profile distributor like Netflix. Um, well, you so know, may, may, maybe now that you're mentioning it, I mean, it, this this does seem kind of hard and everything. Now, now you're making me a little <laughs> nervous. So you're just throwing may, maybe so many I red flags, should. brother. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. I mean, to be honest, I want people to know on different levels what goes on. Yeah. But no, it's good. So you know, maybe at that point, I would say, well, you know what? I, I do have another five hundred dollars that I can that I can get for a boom operator for the for the day. Is, that, awesome. is that okay? Yeah. Um, you know? Are you doing rehearsal days uh, on this? Because it sounds like it's a really intricate setup, and you've got a lot of re rehearsal that you're going to have to do with your talent. It is a short film. How many pages is the well, script? Well, yeah. Now that you mention it, you know, it, it, we only have these actors for guys. We're completely role playing right now. If you just uh, chimed in, this is Thomas. Oh, we're Pop live. Thomas Hi. Cassetta. Yeah, but we're just giving a scenario of w what uh, might happen on a job. Uh, uh, lead me back in because I totally forgot what I was saying. What happened? Uh, you want to? I got it. We were live. Yeah. We're, we're going to go live at one p.m. And yeah, you know, there we do have like oh, that, so that, that is, two this camera. This is a live, a live broadcast. Oh, did I forgot to tell you about that? Live broadcast to Netflix. Yeah. Brother, send me a script, and I'll uh, I'll talk to you later. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right, maybe not live. Sorry, we'll scratch that part. So it's not you live. You know, honestly, it becomes about creating. A, I th I think we could keep role playing, yeah, yeah, and course, it, of course, we would like we just see everybody People would be laugh. like, shut the fuck yeah, up, yeah, or not. Um, the reality is is that it's a conversation. Uh, a lot of producers call and they're looking for uh, a quick answer. How much is it going to cost? You know, and. To me, it's about converting those conversations, those quick, silly conversations where you become this, you know, this pre-cut object for them that they just have to fit into their budget and fit into their, you know, okay, check the box, I got a sound mixer. Yeah. That is not how we serve yeah. our our clients. Yeah, yeah. It is yeah. never going to be how we serve our clients. You don't just go on Craigslist and hire any old drummer just because they bought a piece of gear and a right. stick yeah yep you know you don't hire a collector of of gear to serve a craft right uh and so if i can't convert the conversation i don't even emotionally invest in it i don't care about the job um that has hurt me mm -hmm. uh you know i i ha i was referred um uh by a um, a really wonderful mixer onto a feature. Um, I forget what it's called. Um, what? Uh, it's the one where the social media addict, and she comes out to LA Instagram. She's following. Uh, oh man! Um, wow! I'm so glad I. <laughs> sorry, I'm horrible. So glad at I'm this. not embarrassing myself with this one. Whatever. Um, so I was referred on this feature and. You know, I was like, I was getting a ton of, I was out in Colorado. I was, I think I was, I was at my, like one of my best friend's wedding. And I was the best, I was like, I just got home after like the reception. It was super Circle? late. Circle? Um, no, something goes, somebody goes west or something like it. Uh, hmm. uh, it, it, it was. Chime um, in if you know it. Um, I forget the mixer. He did a he did a fine job. Uh but uh it was with um she's an Avenger and gosh, this is so embarrassing. Um ultimately uh it it, it turned out to be a really, really incredible film and I remember reading the script and being like, Oh wow, you know, I'd really love to do this but by the time I had finished reading the script yeah. and the line producer had sent me the script, they were totally understanding that I wanted to read it before before, you know, Jumping talking in. about any of the details. Yeah. Uh they had crewed it. The director had said, hey, I got my guy. Yep, done. And it's like, okay, well, it kind of bit me in the ass. Yeah. Um, the, the reality Take is... Take the job and read it later type attitude instead yeah, of... And I mean, if I weren't... If I were in a position where I just absolutely, like, needed to jump on work, 
Mm -hmm. uh, I've been fortunate enough that I haven't had to do that. Um, but if I were in that position, I would have done. I would have jumped on it. Sure. Yes, absolutely. I'll do it. Let's sign the paperwork, and then we'll talk about the details. And then you can get the negotiation going. That's another tactic: is ingratiate yourself, get in, and then, you know, and then do the negotiating. But right. I don't think that really. That's never been the way. That's never been my style. Mm. So, mm -hmm. um, I like a conversation. Um, Sometimes, you know, I have to be honest, sometimes those jobs where you think, oh, my God, this is this is sh just a shit show. Um, even in post-production, um, I had a job w uh, come in like four years ago, and it was um, it was one of those emails you get as a post sound mixer. And they're like, hey, can you clean this up? And you listen to it. And it is, you know, it's just awful. It's yeah every problem you could possibly have yeah the boom mic it's only a boom microphone the boom microphone is 10 feet away in yeah. a kitchen yep. with everything on on yeah exactly and and, and you, the wind's blowing on the mic and i just can imagine this this director who you know it looked fine the acting was good mm -hmm. and i'm like okay well that's there let me take a chance on this guy sure. so i said i i can't clean this up jake and mike how's it going guys what's up uh you know, I, I can't clean this up. It's not possible. Yeah. But I want to try something with you. And if you're willing to, you know, humor me for a couple hours, you know, pay my pay me for a couple hours, we'll experiment and we'll try something. And I think if we if this works, I think we can we can pull your film together. Okay. And so what happened was I I I grew up actually um, when I was when I was working in Denver and I could barely make ends meet. I was doing live sound. I was doing whatever I could. I was really really young. I actually got brought into a lot of sales situations. So I was selling for CD replications. I was selling for uh, trade exchanges. So I was helping companies trade and work. You know, and, and I was selling audio equipment at Guitar Center. Like it seems like every musician coming out of high school ends up doing for a year. Everybody um, in the VM discussion who's worked at Guitar Center, take a shot. Yeah. All right. Then there's Everybody, like, take a drink. You've worked there. I have too. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but it it kind of, in a way, it's like sales experience. Yeah. And so when you're in that, you like you have to learn how to convert people. And sure. so for me, when I yeah. saw this guy who's like, acting's fine, you know, but let's... Um, Let's build the world around this film. Uh, let's rebuild it. And he, he's like, okay. So he came over, and um, we read a couple. He was also an actor in the film. So, you know, he was this up-and-coming, you know, TV, TV actor. Mm -hmm. And so he did this short on the side. We replaced everything. He came over. Uh, we just did two or three lines, wild. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said, I don't want you to be spooked by the ADR process. Yeah. Let's let's trust our technology. And it was a huge risk because when you when you expand and and reshape audio, there's there are definitely you know ways it, it reveals you know the hand. It reveals the artist's hand, where it's like, oh wow, you can hear something was manipulated there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he came in and he watched his scene, and then we did a couple wild takes like we would do on a set. And then I laid them in, and uh, so you didn't do it timed. No, you just just you know because just listen to yourself him, and just let it let yourself get used to it, right? Used to the rhythm again. Feeling out this timed. client to him, it was like he's gonna walk away from the project, and my paycheck was gonna walk away if if I didn't sell him on this. And part of it was like, you know what? Fuck it, I'm curious. Yeah, let's see what happens. Right. So we did it. Uh, it worked. We used impulse responses, uh, and then we had this. Uh, we had the actor come in, and I I took all of my studio um, panels mm -hmm. and bass traps and diffusers, and I put them up in my kitchen because this whole film took place in a kitchen. Mm. And this actress came in, and they relearned the script based on the film, and they redid the entire scene eight times. Oh my gosh, and man! You went all out, yeah. dude. So. I had taken notes on, on a script that I printed out about performance and everything, but I really wanted them to feel at home. Wow. So it was this huge gamble, and it was silly. It was absolutely silly because 
but I was addressing, and I, and I know, like, I would, on, honestly, I would probably never do this again. Yeah, exactly. You'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> let's just go in for ADR. Yeah. yeah. But the reality is, is like, hey, let's let's see what happens. We did it. It worked great. Nobody knew it was ADR when they screened it for, so we replaced, we replaced all of the, everything with Foley, as you normally do in a post-production process. Mm-hmm. Everything was rebuilt uh, for an M&E. Uh, music and effects mix for those music of you who are wondering mix, what that go. is. Good. I keep looking at my phone. That's uh, all right. My eyeline. In fact, I put up this weird thing while I was talking to you so I could have it here instead of looking down. Oh, there we go. Can it go in? Don't break the iPad. Amazing. There we go. Cool. Now we're being all high tech. Uh, it was clean. Apparently, the no joke hashtag is huge. The no joke that's, hashtag that's, no joke. That's gonna get some. That's gonna get some peeps looking at this thing the good all no right. joke guitar center employee number 018848 <laughs> reporting for duty what's up chris uh so we re-recorded this whole film uh-huh but you know what it did huh it converted a client to me and to my work uh f- in both aspects of the chain. unless i royally mess up or he royally messes up or our you know for whatever reason our paths go a different way I am now deeply nurtured by this director. Right. We did a film uh, shot on 35, uh, Sheridan Toyota and Rie Nasu were my boom operators. And we shot, when I said, I need two boom operators for this, if we're shooting 35 and you're working with a lot of visual depth and you don't want ADR, and he's like, I don't want ADR ever again. Uh, I'm like, well, then I need two boom operators. Respect the boom, then. <laughs> yeah. And he and he and he did it. Good. He brought them in. That's good. You know what? Yeah. So, I mean, the the smart guys get bit once. Right. You know, everybody tries to take but, a little, or you, you know, know, or whatever. When, when we were talking about this, you know, you would, you know, you would ask like my background. And yeah. I have a really hard time talking about my background because honestly, I feel like I have really humble beginnings because I've, I'm self-taught. I don't feel like I was brought up a, a under, you know, a bunch of A-list mixers. I feel like I'm constantly making mistakes when it comes to like how do you how do you deal in a in a big market. But my my focus as as a professional has always been um, serve my client, right? Serve the story, and I just love storytelling. Period. Yeah. So. I think the more and more we can bridge that gap ourselves uh, to the creative, um, to the creative family on a on a film set, we can convert them into filmmakers who nurture sound as a process. And that it, I seem I, I we hear have to all these involve complaints. ourselves in that process. Yes. That yeah, like like the fact that you said earlier, it's kind of resonated in my head a little bit more now that we're talking more. Is the fact that they're like, oh, well, w- the guy he had a guy. So I, he just, he got a guy. Uh, okay, well, we're not a, just a guy. Right, right. We're part of a process. And you know what? If we read a script right now, I put a script in front of me and put a script in front of you, the same one, Argo. Right. I'm going to read it. And if I talk to the producer, I'm going to say, you know what? If I did this movie, if we, if we went back in time, I would record it this way. Sure. And you talk to him, you're going to say a completely different way. You sure. might say different microphones. You might say different perspectives. You're going to use a different crew, which means the mics are going to be different places. Whatever. Right. Things are going to change. I got, I'm on it, guys. Turn it off. Turn it on. There we go. Coming back up. And, yeah, so that's it. You know, soon soon we're gonna get the triple cam back, guys, and then yeah. that won't happen. But yeah. we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. That just kind of resonated with me. What do you think about that? Now that we're starting to get into the post talk with Thomas Cassetta, by the way, everybody. Yeah. Um. I mean, the only thing to me that ever resonates, um, I mean, other than just the sound of a perfectly placed boom microphone over a great performance Mm -hmm. is serving the story. Um, You know, be it a stand-up comedy show and I'm serving the narrative that 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 person is trying to tell and his interaction with the audience or her interaction with the audience and you have this this emotional experience that the audience can can travel on, I'm, I'm serving that. Find something that resonates with whatever you're serving and, and, and serve that, uh, you know, that interpretation of it. And if there need to be notes, take those notes, convert them into a technical, you know, a technical change that needs to be adjusted to, to serve the note and keep moving forward. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it's always about serving the story. Yeah. It's And it's always about, uh, I think Mark Ulano has brilliantly called it being a member of the band. Because that's what be. it is. You know? Yeah. Got to in sync it up with sound. Yeah. Sync did it you, up. Did I'm trying to do a play on words. Work with me here. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. So, what, I mean, what else? Hey, Don. Don. Don Sufo. How are you doing, buddy? Oh, my gosh. Much love to you. Hey, Don. Guys, everybody, just want to say what's up. We're here on Video Mantis Live doing a discussion with Thomas Cassetta about post-production. Let's take a quick second and talk about the seminar that's coming up. Yes. Since we've been talking for a little while, tell me a little bit about this. this What's going on? This seminar is so much fun. It's a seminar happening um, on Sunday. On Sunday. That's coming up in a few days. It's co- yeah, it's coming up in a few days. Okay. Um, and for the last two years, it's been uh, myself and Joel Schrack, uh, who, if you don't know who Joel Schrack is, oh my gosh, look up this dude and okay. look up his his uh, IMDb resume. It's incredible. Nice. Um, he has served every. It seems like every position. He, I mean, he's worked. Uh, he, I, I mean, honestly, when I found out, I was. I mean, sorry, Joel, if I embarrass you, I love you. Uh, when I found out, I was going to be um, hosting or, or or working with the boom operator, or uh, you know, a, a crew member from The Player, which is one of my f- most favorite mixes mm-hmm. I've ever heard. Uh, I I just sort of had like a, you know, just sort of a celebrity moment, and I was so nervous to work with him the first time. And anyway, uh, so this is our third time. Third time. It's gonna be myself and Joel again. Mm-hmm. We're gonna be at Smart Sound West in wow. Santa Monica on Sunday, uh, and. Here's that moment. Hopefully the cash. I am about to post a link to the Eventbrite uh, event. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, my good. gosh. No, it didn't work. It, I don't think it's saved. Julian Beeson, how are you doing, brother? Uh, yeah, so we're, do, we're doing... $1 uh, spent on production saves 10 in post. Jim Hulse, good good point. Good note. Sorry, keep going. Um, I think you need to p- play to get back into it. Do I? Yeah, like go into the discussion now. We're do we have some intermission music? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I could add music, but you know what? Everything's kind of getting quirky today on this. So, uh, uh, are your hey, names Chris. Thomas? You've been served, yeah. Uh, I have an idea. If Chris Howland is on this thing, Chris, you want to post the link? Yeah, uh, Chris, help us out if, if you're uh, still there. Michael Fanner, how you doing, buddy? Um, don't want ADR, then you uh, guys got to bring bring the bucks. Absolutely. Uh, you know, actually, that's interesting because in this seminar, we actually talk about ADR, mm-hmm. and uh, part of um. I think as sound mixers, we get heavily invested into the idea of whether or not ADR uh, ends up in the film. Uh, I've worked on a number of projects where there was plenty of ADR, Mm -hmm. uh, some of it to fix bad locations, some of it to fix mistakes, I'm sure. Moments Mm -hmm. where, you know, you couldn't tell something was going to happen. or uh, Exactly. And I think there's this this sort of people identify with whether or not ADR was uh, was utilized by the production and somehow make it personal and sometimes make it about like, oh, my gosh, they had to fix my mistakes or it wasn't good enough or, oh, my gosh, look how many ADR mixers were on this. They must have yeah. had really bad sound. We need to, I mean, in a way, and we, we always need to be invested in whether or not we're capturing the performance. I don't mm-hmm. want I don't want to communicate that at all. Right. Because if we're able to... Comp- capture the performance if it's ultimately what the director wants uh then then that's the best thing we could ever possibly do right is help bring that orchestra to life right that being said sometimes things change in post-production uh part of the seminar uh, i hope to show an example of where adr was never uh, a production f- you know flap or flop or mistake it was always let's approach this scene from a different perspective, be it from a you know um, a subjective character's perspective, where we're suddenly sucked into the world of this character and we're out filming on the streets of Burbank and there's cars passing and there's all this stuff, but we want to go oh, exactly. into this world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is nothing a production guy alive 
could do potentially to capture the nuances of breath oh, or totally. the the separation yeah, uh, of, of all these elements. Hey, I know we're here on uh, Burbank Boulevard at nine o'clock in the morning, but can you go behind that McDonald's over there and just record those voiceover lines? We'll use them in post. <laughs> no, that's not going to work. You know <laughs> what I mean? So uh, you're going to have to go well, and do that. In I would post. never tell. I would right. never tell that to a. a you know, a producer or an AD on set. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we'll record um, it, of course. And then the actor then gives can... the actor gives you that knowing look where they're like, really? Yeah, yeah well, okay. just be like, hey, you know, enjoy the paycheck when you go in for the ADR session. Absolutely. You know, uh, that's, that's another, that's be another thing about. is uh, a lot of times on, on TV shows and on films uh, with proper budgets, ADR is already contracted with the actors. And so this argument that mm -hmm. a lot of production mixers have in their, you know, in their you know, in their tool shed, so to speak, is they pull out, they're like, think of all the money I'm going to save you on ADR. They're like, we've already budgeted. Like, yeah. why are you making, the, you're just making me not like you. Yeah, uh, it's like a gimmicky thing. Right. It's like a cheap sell. Instead of, instead of like saying, hey, would you, uh, I think we can avoid ADR in this moment. Um, sure, how about you we, say that again? That sounded really good. No, seriously, I, like, I, you know, I, I like I like pointing out like key things that people can say. Right. You know? One of my one of my favorite I'm giving away I'm giving away all my tricks. That's good. Um, it's good. But part of it really is is changing your mindset. And I know, you know, some of us are very technically minded and you know, I have this sort of O C D streak with some of the, some of the things in my world and so like trying to break out of that mindset yeah. is hard sometimes. But if you can, st uh, you know, back to the ambassador thing. If when and we're back to production mixing. But if you're, right. um, if you're, ser when you're serving your client, you're serving their scene. You're serving their needs, not, and you are able to bridge that gap between their needs and your needs. Mm -hmm. And you're able to say, for instance, when some, when s this is my favorite, when something, and uh, when something's really distracting, mm -hmm. and I know it can be controlled. Uh, that's the that's the key part. When I know it can be controlled, and I know a change will help, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I go up a direct to a director, and directors, you know, approaching directors is like you have to be very careful. Yep. If you have a relationship with them, great. All but always proceed with caution in the <laughs> sense that those people have so much on their plate. Yeah. There's so much pressure to get it right, and there's so much money on the line that the director. The only reason I ever communicate with the director is to ask them how they're doing uh to just be a pal or uh you know when we're not rolling or when uh i come up to them i compliment the scene and i say you know this is a really beautiful intimate moment between these characters right now this this noise is kind of taking away a little bit of that intimacy um from my perspective, are you concerned about it? Would would you like to? Do you think we could make a couple changes to affect that that level? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now you can reword it, and I sort of bumbled over like kind no, of but the, it's the great. clarity. But it's what you're doing is you're shifting the focus away from. There's a there's, there's a, a noise. problem. Oh my gosh, What's there's the a problem? problem. And like you get associated as sound mixers as a fucking guy who comes over when something's wrong. Yeah, exactly. And it's That's like the only time he does. Uh, yep. I we need to start understanding yep. how we sound to to other departments and and realizing that when when you bridge that gap, you're communicating to their needs. When you talk to the AD, you're communicating to their needs on the schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you can yeah. when you can in the way that you communicate in a non-patronizing way and say, I understand, I have an understanding of what's going on here. This is what I could use. Uh, and ultimately, when you're dealing with a director, you always have to serve their understanding of the relationship between the characters or the char that moment the character is in right there. If you are unable to communicate, the chances of you getting through, unless that person is already invested in sound mm -hmm. and already has an ear for it and an understanding for it, the difficulty is when they already have an understanding for it and you don't recognize that fact yet. And then you start preaching. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, like, dude, I know what I'm doing and you're just being a real annoying gnat on my shoulder right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, with a film that we're going to showcase on Sunday at, uh, at Smart Sound West, um, I'm going to show 
uh, a film that I also produced that um, we just announced will be airing on HBO. Uh, no, we don't know the air date. Take that back. Is being licensed by HBO starting June first. So. Mm. It'll show up on the That's HBO awesome, platform. Man. Congrats! It's inc- yeah, I mean it. It it blows my mind yeah. that we were that we were able to do that. Yeah. Um, this little ragtag team of like I was serving my friend as a, what up, David? Sorry, I gotta ignore your Just call. Just call him and tell him to go Facebook Live. Yeah. Um, with us. If uh, anybody knows David Griesinger, tell him just to come live and he can talk to us here. Yeah. Uh, so David was actually my boom operator on that show and he did the when I when I transitioned oh, to really? a producer so on the funny. show Can he you top me off, by the way? who's uh, oh yeah, yeah. Mind you. um when I transitioned to a producer um he came in as the uh mixer thank you um uh, ooh, hot, hot, hot. yeah so uh part of that show was knowing what he what he tr- a he trusted the relationship mm-hmm. but we went into that show planning on ADR mm mm-hmm, mm mm-hmm. um it was you, when you understand it, when you understand that it's a tool and you can start having creative conversations, it's not like it comes first as you're like, okay, we're just going to ADR this. And then the director's like, huh? <laughs> it's, you create. Yeah, if the you, sound mixer's coming around going, boy, yeah. Right. If you're, if you're fortunate enough to work with a director who trusts you and brings you in and nurtures sound into the process before production starts, oh my goodness, hold on to that director uh, unless, you know, it, you realize they are not creating good work. Um, <laughs> that's one thing. Uh, this director, fortunately, was creating some of the best work that I'd ever seen, hmm. uh, and he had this attitude towards sound and everybody in the community uh, uh, around his projects that if if I invest in them as artists, they're going to in turn invest in my project. And so that is ultimately how it uh, it shaped up. Um, and so... Uh, we went into that knowing that I'm not going to fight certain battles. Mm-hmm. But then we went into it, some scenes where he gave us full license to tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, can these actors not say their lines off screen? Yeah, He's like, exactly. yeah, hey, don't, don't yeah. say those lines. Don't get it interrupted It was never a battle. Yeah. I never had to pick a battle. It was always just... Um, I, I know well, you were I part know of the process. We, right, right. You know, you were part of the process. <laughs> right. And when you went to him, it's not like you're not annoying him. You're not coming. Hey, there's an air conditioning on the scene. I need to turn right. it off. I, I, there, there's, there's noise next door. I need to turn it off. Hey, I, this needs to stop. You know, like, right. oh, my God, I want this guy off my set. Right. You know, like, I totally get you don't want to be that guy. So what, what my parents would always say is, you know, you picked your battles to win the war. Certainly. Uh, and we had that war. We had the war plans worked out weeks in advance and the funny thing is is that when we went into post-production i've never completed uh, a reel of film faster than i completed the post-production on that film yep because it was nurtured from front and back um and had an incredible crew doing it in post-production but the dialogue just cut together even those difficult scenes where it was you know we used uh a lot of the dialogue that I didn't think we were going to use, and then yeah. we ate, we planned on ADR in some scenes that we didn't end up using, and then ultimately, uh, R- Ryan wanted to replace one of the um, one of the characters, and the manner in which she um, spoke Spanish, hmm. because her relationship to the language right. of Spanish changed the relationship of her character and how it related to the other characters in the scene. Interesting. So we ADR'd all of her Spanish lines. Mm-hmm. And so then it became about um, matching, you know, matching the sources on set and matching the performances, uh, you know, in a very traditional sense, you know, uh, and, bringing her, and bringing the actor in. Uh, we brought her in twice, and um, yeah. Wow. It turned out, like, nobody that I, nobody's ever said, oh, my gosh, that ADR cassette, you need to go <laughs> rework that. Yeah. Here's a, here's a question for some beginner students. How um, how often is it that you are going to work as the production team as well as the post-production team, that you're going to see the project through to the end? What do you think? For me personally, uh, on the narrative project, it's always a pitch. Unless it's a director with whom I've, uh, you know, ingratiated myself um, or created a really strong relationship, then it's just sort of assumed. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of the discussion from the front, like, okay, so you're gonna you're gonna come in, and you're gonna finish this. But the reality is that when production changes, when the production department changes, those decisions all come under different um, contracts mm -hmm. and different relationships. Right. And so a director may not have the ability to say, my guy is doing this. He That may not be a battle that that director is able to fight at that point. So um, I approach every project that I come on to as a production mixer as an opportunity to potentially create a relationship for post-production. But sometimes it's not a reasonable assumption based on either timeline, my schedule already, and, you know, uh, my my ambition as a post-sound um, mixer or um, project manager, in a sense, uh, doesn't meet the scale of a lot of guys in town. Mm -hmm. And so when you're taught, you know, it doesn't make sense for me necessarily to do every project. Um, for me, uh, it makes more sense to do projects where there's uh, a clear creative connection with the director and the producer tags along as a result right um yeah i mean i mean we're all growing we're all learning we're all like sort of learning how to adapt our um our careers to the work as it, as it comes in mm -hmm. and so that's a very important part of my life right now um you know, aside from, you know, my personal life, which is taking me in different directions in terms of uh, how I'm sharing my time. Uh, every job you take on when you when you go from production to post, you have to commit everything to it because there is so much involved in managing that. Yeah. And I don't know, being. Yeah, be careful when you take on a post job. Yeah. Make sure you understand. And what the you're, worst what mistake you're you can on. ever made, and I have done this, in, you know, yes. more times than I could ever possibly apologize for, is taking on more What's work up, than I could possibly handle, uh, yeah. in the service of doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, you, you know, sometimes Trying you have to please to, a client right. really, really big, being like, man, I'm gonna really have to polish this turd, <laughs> right? You know, as we call it, and it's. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't uh, don't oversell your abilities and your ability to you know serve a timeline. Uh, when you're talking about post production, you're talking about you know it would be I would do my fellows who are only serving post production um, communities yeah. and projects. I would be in a d disservice to be saying, oh yeah, I can handle it. You know. I'm a boutique, uh, boutique re-recording mixer, and you know, and <laughs> an entrepreneur. Sure, yeah. my scale matches your your film. It's, that's not true. Uh, sometimes it's just better at a different house. Yep. Um, you know, and if they if they want something uh, fast and cheap, I always turn that down. Mm -hmm. If they want it fast and cheap, I'm sorry. Go I, to someone else. Right. It's like. It's not why I'm in this business. I hope, you know, I'm I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it to make art and to make good work. And maybe I'll be out of business in two years because I commit to that sort of model. But the reality is, is that that is where my heart is. And I can't commit my own personal time. You know, and I mean, we're talking, I mean, a lot of people, I don't have any kids. I'm not married. I've got three cats and, you know, or two cats and a rabbit. I have four. It's okay, guys. He's normal. I'm still weirder than everybody. Um, so, like, my life is nuts with two cats and a rabbit. I and mean, we're talking about guys who have families, who need to support families. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to honor yourself. Yeah. And you need to honor your – when you honor yourself and you honor your ability to serve the job uh, at a budget that honors you, not on a shitty budget that honors your timeline for your – or that honors the client's timeline – you know, I mean, if you if you're married, if you have kids, and you're just sort of getting into this, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, maybe that's the only way that you can get the work and and have the experience. But you're gonna lose a lot in your life. To I don't know, maybe this is getting like well, deeper than yeah. I mean, than, basically, whenever any like, uh, I totally respect the opinion. I guess what I say is everybody has different perspectives sure. in life, and everybody has to do what's right for them and what they love. Sure. And you know, pretty much leave it at that. You know, I. I uh, 
as as a new dad, you know, my my daughter is now a year old. Um, it's hard. Holy hell! Congratulations, it's hard. Thank you. I mean, it was awesome. Awesome. I made the birthday cake. I'll show it to you later. It's so cool. It's so fun. But um, but yeah, it's definitely it brings interesting new challenges into the world. But you know, it's it's just an adventure. Right. That's all it is. Right. You know. So. I've learned a lot from Hashtag my dads. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've learned a lot from my peers who have kids and who have families and the way what that, not to do it. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. The way that they approach the job changes. And, you know, I think, I think, uh, when you're young and passionate and you have this idea of what your career is going to be and you're going to change minds and you're going to change industries, even like how we change. I mean, how we seek to change education and how people learn. And how, I mean, yeah. I mean, in anything that we seek to do, uh, you know, I, people who have, who have families and have kids and, and make that change in their life. And it's like, I used to think that I wanted kids and, and now it's like my kid is my career and my kid is my <laughs> rabbit and cats. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, well, what are some of the other topics that you are talking about in the seminar? Uh, so we are talking about – we're going to uh, show and um, reveal uh, production tracks as they come in. Um, so you're going to talk about the process of how it gets to post? I'm going to skip over a lot of the sort of minutia of how it gets there because, like, I, I want to show them their tracks. Okay. An example of their tracks when they're ingested and reconformed or conformed to um, – an edit session. Okay, so then I do me a favor then, just sure. because of the fact that um, Video Mantis caters to a lot of students. Sure. Um, so you're saying that you are now sitting down at your computer and you're ingesting the footage and the audio. Who did? It, where did it come from? Basically, give me okay. a quick thirty second or minute. How did the audio get to you? So and there you said conform. There's Tell a number. That. There's a number of different workflows. Sure. Uh, I'll. I'll. I'll Give I'll focus on basic. two. Okay, fair um, The first workflow is an older process, which um, I actually am more endeared to because of the the technology side of it and the metadata side of it and how it all comes in. And uh, is, uh, but you will essentially, and a lot of, and I know a lot of TV shows are still working on this uh, um, on this workflow. But an editor will cut to the mix, and so the sound mixer's job is actually to serve that first impression of the of the edit when they get in and they're they're serving the screen and they're serving the narrative of what's happening coming in and you know shaping the way that everything sounds and trying to create a, a you know a story with the dialogue serving as we all know like one of the most important parts of a of a film soundtrack right um so you you work off a mono mix and then uh in post production um i will get a uh, a number of files. I'll get an e a number of EDL files, edit decision lists, and I'll get a picture file, and I'll get an XML, and I'll get a number of ways that I could rebuild the project. And what I do now is I will I will take both options. The second option is to get an AAF or an OMF. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of these file-based delivery um, translations? is that you have different editors working in different workflows. Yeah. Some people are working in Premiere. Some people are working in Avid. I've even worked on stuff working in Final Cut X, and you'd be surprised at how incredible the tools around that piece of software are, uh, being an open open um, pretty interesting. source uh, platform. Yeah. Um, but uh, the EDL process will get... We'll get the mix tracks from the camera, so it'll usually be two tracks or on four or six tracks, and it's sort of cut up to match the editor's decisions. And then we'll get that edit decision list in, and we will run that into uh, either EDLoad or other um, EDL conform softwares where it reads the edit decisions and it rebuilds based on the role and the time code on the day and... Um, sometimes the date and time and other other metadata buried within the production sound files. Wow. And so the fact, you know, having your having the date correct on your recorder is incredibly important. Having the time code accurate across all 
uh, not just the cameras for sync because um, but having it uh, it not break in the middle of a day mm -hmm. I mean there's a number of um, number of ways just to sort of maintain uh, I one of my mentors told me uh, time code is one of the simplest uh, simplest tools and the fastest way to get fired is to fuck up time code. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Absolutely. Because it is the backbone on which every process in post-production is built. Yeah. And so the user bits could represent the date or it could be something that the production hands down to you and says, here's your user bit, and that helps them sort in post-production. Exactly. Or, um, so... Guys, there we're are guys talking about user bits, by the way. If you look at a slate and you open it up, you see the numbers going across right. the slate. That's your time code numbers. And when you clap the slate, it shows you the user bits. Right. And, and what we usually do is put time code. I'm sorry, now, not time code. We put the date into the user bits. Right. That is one. That is one method. One way. Uh, one so, method. So um, the other thing to to recognize is that there are guys out there who are not editing, or they're not. I'm sorry, they're not shooting with uh, time code based recorders. Now, I'm a firm believer that. You sh maybe you should be. <laughs> yeah, you should be if you're but, trying to do sound. I mean, there are guys yeah. out there or young guns out there serving these films, and most likely those films won't have a process to support this workflow. The reality is that those that metadata assists in uh, naming and pairing up clips to yep. the original mix track. Uh, it can be done otherwise, mm -hmm. and it certainly can be delivered in a file-based uh, format. Sure. But having to re when you go through as a dialogue editor and you take all these production tracks and, uh, you know, if you have a conforming editor, that's fantastic. If you don't and you're doing it as a dialogue editor, uh, you bring all this stuff in and you build your you build your sessions. Not having the metadata uh, is is really kind of tragic because yeah. it can really speed you up when you can just turn on the channel name in Pro Tools now. Totally. Or, yep. um, and Pro Tools has conforming tools in them. You mm -hmm. don't need an outside software. You can rebuild a session after it's been edited using a guy, uh, the production, the field uh, guide track function now. Um, we won't dig into that too much. I mean, yeah. we, can't, we can't show it. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, Rebuilding the session is incredibly important, and having a dialogue editor, if um, if you're working on a narrative film or any any project where you have the ability to look at the uh, the track names mm -hmm. um, and quickly identify um, which character is on which track, because uh, more and more, I'm actually not mixing on like an A B C D E, you know, perspective based uh, re-recording mix where. I drop the tracks on where the camera perspective represents, and I know a lot of guys do still do that. It's a really, it's a really great, quick uh, workflow. Mm -hmm. I work a lot with uh, character-based track names, and so I'll do my dialogue based on, uh, you know, character speaking, and it opens up a lot of the field to uh, processes where I can take. Uh, s the sound of a character from another scene, and I can utilize the tone. Uh, sort of the tonal curve of that microphone and apply it to another microphone that maybe was um, wow. maybe a lavalier where I had to rely on a lavalier, but yeah, I exactly. wanted to have the, this tonality of a, of a boom and the, you know, uh, you know, when, when you have tracks that are kind of recorded clean, you know, clean enough, you can do that. Sweet. You can open yourself yeah. up to that. But uh, so what we're doing in back to the original question, what we're doing in the seminar is we're going to show an A and B of, here are the original tracks. Here is what happens to them after they're dialogue edited and mixed. Yeah. Now lis listen to the difference. Then we're going to play the whole mix on top of that. Uh, this is what I hope to do. Clicking back on everybody. Um, Heard it. Play the whole mix for them and, and then take the dialogue out mm -hmm. and say this is a, this is an, a music and effects deliverable. And uh, when, when you're a production mixer, learning about the m and &E, and we hope to bridge this gap with the Bridging the Gap seminar um, is, you know, part of a production sound guy uh, that's s part of what served me best being a production sound mixer is often what I learned about the post process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the more we can bridge the understanding of like how much of your dialogue track is actually going to be used, like how right. much of your production track is actually going to be used. Start this conversation early. Yeah. Uh, hey, um, do you guys have a Foley budget? Um, or, you know, what? a lot of it you can glean from different stories. Like, oh, this is a, you know, romantic comedy 
you know, in, this is a character film. It's not an action film or a horror film or, you know, some some film where this the supporting soundtrack is dominant. Um, right. You can you can learn a lot about how how to pick your battles and how to understand when your work is going to be utilized um, by studying the M and E and studying what what goes in what you know uh, what gets converted to a production effect and gets delivered you know as an effect track um, how you know the the way that uh, if you guys don't know um, a production uh, production effects what happens in the dialogue edit is you will have sound from the set where it's not dialogue but it's um technically effects so it's mm. you know i can get you some water if you need some um <laughs> subtle hint i ran out sorry um yeah no uh but it's like uh you know it's on set foley or it's you know it's maybe something has a really unique sound that you want to capture on you know maybe it's the sound of a car approaching and there's no dialogue a dialogue editor will take that sound he's not going to trash it because it's not on the dialogue track he's going to take that sound or she's going to take that sound and she's going to dump it onto the production effects track that gives the uh mix team and the design team an option to integrate that into their work hmm. and so um if there's no dialogue on it why not use it in the effects track and so when a foreign distributor hears it they hear all of that stuff in their m and e the music and effects down mix uh um in all of their you know all their deliverables and so the only thing they really replace is just the spoken language even breaths and singing and all sorts of stuff can be dumped into a dialogue alts track right, and so right. when i really hope that people see like oh my gosh like it's not just a one to one relationship of I put them, you know, and it and it sort of the takes the boom there goes to our ears here. The lovely thing is it takes the ego out of it. Yeah, okay. I I think there's like sort of this like auteur's uh, ego associated with uh, you know the production mix in a sense, and that uh, that ego is not like a bad thing. It's it serves us. It sure. serves our ability to tell a story. It serves our ability to solve problems and make it better and to help this film. Right, but mm -hmm. uh, the auteur's mentality is like, oh my gosh. No ADR. You have to use my. You have to use my tracks. Yep. You know everything has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. If there's a dog bark, oh my god, I'm gonna throw my headphones and freak out. No, it's like when I. I'm hoping that when they see everything separated out, they're like, oh wow. I can take my ego out of this. I I can know how to serve these moments. I can. Sure. You know, and then a lot of films they just fully fill everything with foley and ambience and design. Yeah, they just do it. They, mm -hmm. It's not even it, it, it. The timeline won't even allow them to um, hem and haw over whether or not they need it. There's just no time to hem and haw. Yeah. It just gets delivered, and the foley team takes it and they fill it. And they fully. do it. Boom. The ambience and background team take it. They fill it. Yep. Boom. And they're you know certainly in communication with the designer or post uh, you know post production supervisor. Yeah. Uh, serving a vision, but it it. You know, it just goes into a system, and that is certainly larger budget projects, but um, we can glean a lot from that, yeah. uh, and we can certainly also uh, help our clients nurture their, you know, a lot of a lot of independent films, the biggest problem is the soundtrack, right? Yeah, exactly. The biggest problem is, I busted my ass recording the production sound, and there is nothing to create a world around this film yeah, exactly. in, in the post So in the post -world. all of the actual failures of the set are 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 heard you know sometimes, i mean i hate yeah. to say it sometimes, you know yeah. because th that's another thing to think about is that you know what everybody on set is an honorary soundie that's what i like to call people <laughs> because you know without the help of the set being quiet and understanding the process and knowing how to help sound they actually add to the soundtrack which makes either your job harder to remove it or it's going to be in the movie. <laughs> right. <laughs> see a sound, hear a sound. Right. You don't see it, you don't want to hear it. Uh, do we have any questions? I don't know. Are people like... Yeah. Ken Siegel's watching and Jim Kumar as well. How are you guys doing? In fact, if you want to talk for a minute, I'll go get you a glass of water. I actually have to go to the other room to grab it. So give me one second. Say hello to people. Guys, uh, chime in and say hello. Let me, let me see the stream. Hey, guys. This is the uh, the fun... 
Tom checks his voicemail section of the talk. Mm hmm. Okay. How useful is non overlapping off camera dialogue? Super, super important. Um, you know, it always, uh, it always kind of depends on the job and all. I mean, as you know, being so um, well versed in in TV, um, I think oftentimes. I mean, we see a lot in comedy. At least I hear a lot in comedies that I'm seeing on on in the in the theater. Is that uh, a single boom scenario will essentially get. Um, turned into a boom and a lav combination scenario all the time and whoever's off camera is on their wire and then whoever's um i personally um when it's a comedy uh and i know i can't always get this and so maybe i don't um uh, maybe i don't get those contracts enough but i ask for two boom microphones in comedy mm -hmm. oh yeah um, with comedy you've got to get both angles there, you yeah. have to you have to get the overlaps. you always have to have a matching set and there's exactly. a really i mean there's a way to sort of approach that conversation and negotiation uh to answer your question Noel, in drama and scripted where they're really following a script absolutely uh keep keep those um off-camera moments clean uh um, yes absolutely <laughs> yeah sorry yeah he needed water uh, he's being a diva uh, I, honestly, I'd say even when off camera may not have same performance, uh, do you mean in terms of a varying performance or do you mean in terms of it might be somebody else reading the lines or, um, obviously when it's a different person reading the lines, you have to keep that separate. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If Tom Cruise decides to go home for the day and they bring a PA in, he better yeah. be talking quiet and not overlapping clearly. Um, Better but bring a damn good PA. Yeah, <laughs> even when off camera may not have the same performance. Um, I think you know it. It just depends on what you're shooting. Are, are you shooting narrative? Are you shooting reality? Um, how many cameras are you shooting? What are they doing? Because if you're physically seeing mouths, the sides of mouths, right. or multiple people in multiple angles. You just need to protect for it. Yeah. You know, that unfortunately, that's it. Because if not, you run into a lot of just weird yeah, I mean, manipulation yeah, to make it work. Here's the thing. It, it's all, For me, it's always, it's always, part of it may be trusting my gut. Some of it may be just studying the scene and studying the performance and understanding how the relationship is developing between the characters. Right. Um, some of it might even just be analyzing the script. Like, do I? Does, is my gut telling me that this scene is like really long and not serving the story? I I mean, and that that's that's a da that's dangerous ground to start bringing your own interpretation of it. But but I'm t like honestly, there's a part of me I'm like these performances are pretty gnarly. Let's get them separate so that the editor can make this yeah, a better exactly. a better performance. Um, but obviously, I never bring that to the table. I never bring my opinion to the table. I, I, I just bring a, you know, the solution to the table. Um, uh, off camera performance different than when on camera. Um, I like getting a diversity of coverage. Um, but if the, if it's a dirty shot and you, you know, you're getting that mouth flap. Um, personally, I like having two booms yeah. and getting, yeah. and getting the off camera equally. Um. My um my perspective has always been Forrest Williams, uh, one of my older sound mixers mentors. Uh, he always taught me. He just says, "The off screen doesn't matter. They're off screen. So, on screen is what's matter. So let's take the perspective of you have one boom first. So the first thing is if they're shooting over my shoulder and I've got to boom you because you're talking, right? And then I talk and I can get to me safely." do it right but he literally would tell me because like he just be he used to go like do you got the you got the main guy on the camera right and i'd be like yeah 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 i got it i got it i got both actually right and then he'd be like okay but just make sure you got that on screen perfect you know and so what would happen is you know you get a couple lines in and i go to the off screen and you stop thinking for just you just short circuit for one second in your brain and you're like oh and then you start talking, I go, whoop, and you scoop it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And he goes, you did it. Ah, I caught you right there. And it was like, damn it. He's right. So he says, 
you, you got to be careful to make sure that you're not sacrificing the quality of the on-screen for the off-screen. Correct. So yeah. now that's with one camera. So if, yeah, if there's one camera, I love to say, hey, shut them up. You know, now if it's, if it's Tom Cruise and Morgan Freeman, I'm probably going to let them do their thing. That's right. another thing. You know, it, it's, it's the perspective of who's in front of you and, and what the director wants, too. You're not right. going to come in and say, no, you're not going to talk because you're not, you're not going to make those decisions, like right. you said. Right. So, yeah, but then when you start bringing in multiple cameras, you got to protect yourself and either include it in the mix or at least have the ISOs. Yeah, I mean, and there's a trend in comedy. There's a trend in comedy where there's just improv. You just got to wire everybody in. And you comedy. just wire everybody. I hate to say and it. Uh, you never we, know. We did um, myself, uh, Yancy Pond, and Rie Nasu, we did an entirely improvised film, uh, feature film, uh, I think. Uh, Two, two years ago survive? now? Two years ago? <laughs> uh, they can tell you. Shoot. Uh, there, were, there were moments where it was it was rough, uh, and we had to learn a different a, a manner in which to communicate. And my director and especially my, the producer, Steven Berger, was so incredibly gracious to us um, because we got stressed. I got stressed. Yeah. Uh, well, ev it's ev hard. Every everybody associated got, got stressed. Um, we had to learn how to sort of cover the chaos. Yeah. And the reality is... That's a really have, good term for it, <laughs> covering chaos. Uh, the reality is that when you introduce eight people into a room with eight microphones and they're improvising, the lavaliers are actually probably not going to be your best serving, uh, you know, microphones. So true. Uh, so true. When, I mean, you just factor in the phase relationships with a bunch of actors moving, mm -hmm. you know, and you have this... Microphone and not knowing right who's going to talk, so you're you're protecting yourself by being up somewhat. Because if you got them all yeah. down, you're going to be late, right? You know, so you got to be so somewhat you're, up. You're, it's a it's sort of like yeah. this numbers game. <laughs> it's this like, game's like go. Oh. Yeah, uh, uh, Devendra Cleary taught me about this sort of uh, finger fidgeting um, move. Finger and, fidgets, yeah. And you know, your your finger is just constantly moving, so that the the amount of yeah. time between the your oil. reaction. You got to get it going. Huh. The the amount of time between your reaction and uh, or you know the the change in your reaction is actually cutting a certain exactly. fraction because your yeah. fingers already moving. Yeah, it's always yeah, it's like so. that little tick and then go oh, move move move. Yeah, helpful end of the word. Um, but in this uh, to to the point of coverage and and double miking, I I I said I need two boom ops on this show, and Stephen trusted me. He's a former sound. Uh, sound guy as well who became a producer and a really incredible producer who um uh really honored us uh on that show turned out no adr whatsoever on the entire show which you know certainly it says a lot to me it says a lot more to the director and the actors and that they were able to take an improvised scene and create uh, an emotional arc of a movie out of it it was yeah. incredible. Wow. Uh, but we were covering the chaos, and the fewer microphones we had at play, and I was following beats. So it was improvised around story beats. So the moment, uh, and, and my boom operators, uh, Rie and Yancey, they were reacting to emotional, uh, or uh, to story moments. So the moment that they heard that, they would cue over to a different part of the conversation because they knew that the chances of that conversation being covered again, you know, that that wouldn't happen, that we'd just sort of follow the story beats. And so uh, uh, Nathan, our, our, our sound designer and re-recording mixer, um, went with the mix on most of it because the simplified process of just using two booms and zoning yep. the scene and zoning the chaos um, – really ultimately served his mix better. Absolutely. And Absolutely yeah. does. Yeah, I remember when I was working on Desperate Housewives, like two stories. The first time on Desperate Housewives, uh, you know, it was like a big, huge scene. It was like 12 or 15 people in one of the houses. And I was just like, oh, man, uh, tell me where the other wires are on the truck. You know, boss, let me know. And he's like, dude, Doug Schamberger, he's got this on one boom. Don't worry about it. You know, like he's yeah. got this whole thing. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, t he went up in the rad picked everybody off and I, I 
that was the first time I was like, okay, that's what a boom operator can do. I mean, right. I knew, but when you see that type of a pro like a six page scene with twelve right. people, it's like second, you know, the the utility is you're getting that one person on the other side that's being the speaker, and then I'll get everybody else. And I was like, yeah. that's insane. No way. Yeah, and he did it. I, you know? I mean, you know, uh, for that film, uh, to answer your question, Jim, uh, we were on location. We didn't have any studio days. Jim's asking what kind of locations for that studio, studio or out in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we were we were out on location. Um, we had, uh, you know, some days in L.A. where <laughs> there's some pretty gnarly locations, but uh, um, ultimately mostly interior. And then we went up into wine country and stayed at this incredibly weird hippie commune. Uh, and so we all grew really, really close as a family. So by the end of the film, like, um, I don't know, I just fell in love with the with the group of people. And I think, you know, you sort of let the stressors go. And, yeah. um, you know, people learn about you and how you react in certain situations. And Films become families. For better or worse. Yeah. Uh, Guys, we're getting close to wrapping it up, by the way. So if you guys have any questions for Thomas Cassetta on this VM discussion, please let us know. Hi, Andrew. How you doing? Uh, but I think to tack on to what you were saying, a lot of, you know, what I've had to learn as a mixer is that, you know, we can tend to, because we have control, mm -hmm. demand it, that we end up demanding that control. Yeah. Uh, and I've... Uh, you know, on my my journey as a sound mixer is learning to, uh, you know, there's some boom operators that you just explicitly trust, and you learn. Um, I don't know if that was right. <laughs> you just learn to trust them. Oh, absolutely. And you know, when a boom operator, because I mean, some of the best that I've ever worked with, it's not about telling them how I'm going to mix it. Mm -hmm. It's they bring the information. It's like yeah. I'll be honest with you, the, the some of the best crews that I've worked with, like when I worked with Don Sufel and Jeff Wexler on a few things, and even Don Sufel and Forrest, um, they wouldn't talk to each other. They just, it just worked. You know what I mean? Like, the boom operator is an extension of the, of the sound mixer, and he, right. he trusts him, you know? Like, that's your right-hand man. It's It's basically the extension of you on set, the extension of your hands. So, well, you know, if you've got somebody that you trust, you're you're just going to be right. able to just pull up those faders, hopefully, and, right. and things are going to work. Right. And the, the be some of the best boom operators I've ever worked with have, um, other than having sort of a, being a triple threat of personality and technical understanding and then political know-how. Yeah. Uh, on, uh, it takes three things, yeah, the triad. I, I mean, and there's so many other things, like True. the physical ability to actually yes. mount the yes. scene. But I would say um, those, those that's a really good, <laughs> learn those. When they're able to say, bring me the sides and say, play the wire here and here. Yeah, exactly. Great. That's it. I can't get it here. I can't get it here. Everywhere else, I'm, I've got right. it. You know, that's that's the type of dialogue that happens between the boom op and the sound mixer on set, yeah. you know, and then they're talking to the utility and having him wire. Hey, this is what's going to happen. You're going to wire these people. You're going to set up a plant over right. here and then it all works. And then there are some guys like David um, Griesinger. He just knows how I work. He knows mm -hmm. how I creatively work. And yep. so he's adapted the way that he works. And every time I work with him, it's just uh, like I know where Tom's going to want a plant microphone. Uh, you know, I know when Tom's going to ask for a clean plate, mm -hmm. uh, yep. And, uh, whoa, the cats, cats. Yeah. Well, very good, man. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much for showing up today, guys. Thanks for having um, me. Jim, Jim is finally saying, boom, pop said it. I don't know what I said. I say too much shit. Um, but hopefully things were said good. I uh, trust me. He's the one that was carrying this conversation. That's for sure. Uh, Jim Hulse says, when I had a boom op, he was in D-Trusted. I hardly had to do anything other than push record. I mean, yeah, some, you know, you can get spoiled <laughs> with yeah. a really good crew. Yeah. You know, that's for sure, you know. So, Thomas, thank you so much for showing up today and helping to talk about this. Uh, once again, guys, they have this seminar coming up. What What is it called again? The Bridging the Gap? Bridging the Gap seminar. Uh, uh Sunday morning, mm -hmm. go to the Eventbrite link. Uh, Chris. It's below. Is it you guys below? You've got to click on it below. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I think you have to click on it and go to, you have to sign up. 
yeah, you have to sign up. You do have to sign up. Don't just yeah. show up. Don't you just sign up. Right. Don't just show up. It's mm-hmm. a it's a really amazing facility. They can't just have people randomly walking. Yeah, in. guys, this is a professional facility. This isn't yeah. just a, a little warehouse that we're just borrowing for the day or yeah. s- or something. You know, so uh, this is a little bit more legit. You know. Yeah. So if you don't see it below, you can also go to the LA Sound Mixers uh, group if you're on that group, or you can go to the freelance uh, Charles Tamaris's freelance Sound Mixers for film and TV. There we go. Uh, and you can look for the link there. And if not, sorry. There we go. Well, maybe you can come back and talk a little bit more about posts at, uh, at another time. There's the link. There's the link again. Thanks, there we Chris. go, guys. So once again, guys, thank you for joining us. And we'll talk to you next time on Video Mantis Live. Bye. Take care. Bye. Click the button. <laughs> and then I got to hit this button. Hey, guys, I'm here with Loki. And he wants you to remember to like us on Facebook because when you do that, you're going to go and get all the notifications. Really? He can't even get through a take.